Okay, good morning, everybody. This is the session on bite-sized community book discussions. Um, our presenter this morning is Andrew Hotman from the Lead Public Library in Clorinda. And Andrew's been around for over a decade um, at Clorinda and has worked in both academic and public libraries across the state. So welcome, Andrew. Well, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to, to be, well, I guess in my office, but be virtually with everyone and and presenting. Uh, we kind of talked a little earlier. I, I've had lots of coffee, so I'll try to go slow. Um, but also I get very excited when I'm talking about kind of fun or challenging programs. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with a bite-sized community book discussions. So I'll start out by defining what a bite-sized community book discussion is. And it's really a, a book club that focuses uh, for us on professional, uh, personal development and or community issues. And we make it bite-sized by breaking it up into little chunks. And before we go into the nuts and bolts of the program, what I wanted to visit with everyone about is a little bit about me, about my library and about our community. Cause uh, I think that that's important when you look at uh, how you might bring a program similar to this uh, to your area. So like Nancy said, my name's Andrew Hopman. I've been here uh, over a decade of the director at the Lead Public Library in Clorinda. Uh, anyone who's attended a session with me in the past or visited with me uh, knows I'm really into uh, community issues and technology. Um, I could talk for hours and hours about that. Uh, here in Clorinda, I'm involved in a lot of community groups and initiatives. Right now we're working on expanding our, our community recreation trail. Uh, I'm married, I have two kids. Uh, both under the age of four uh, and a dog. And I'm really into uh, biking, tennis and pickleball. And uh, generally you catch me reading nonfiction. Right now, uh, I just started to read uh, The Tipping Point, uh, which is very fitting after a year like 2020, uh, but it's a book that I had never picked up and, and found it on bridges and decided to do it. And, and uh, it's, it's a good read. Moving on to our library, um, the Lead Public Library, we have a service population of about 7,500, so that makes us an E-size library. Uh, I had to include um, 2019 statistics. I've actually been putting together our 2020 statistics, um, but they're not too, uh, too uh, flattering to look at or, or comparable. Um, but you can see we had about over 40,000 visits and about 70 or uh, about seven, 75,000 in circulation. Uh, I've always been a big uh, proponent of kind of programs and events, which has made it very difficult uh, in 2020. Um, you can see 10,000 attendees at our 447 programs. Although, um, you know, for an e-size library, our budget is kind of average. Um, one thing I'll stress about today's program is uh, really we haven't spent much money um, on these programs. So I think the, the budget can can be a mute point and, and this bite-sized book clubs could be done by just about any library out there. I wanted to spend a little bit to talk about our, our community, uh, especially after the session this morning, which I thought was wonderful. Um, the city of Clarinda itself um, has about 5,000 people. Uh, we're primarily a white um, middle-aged community with German and Irish background. Um, our medium household income is just about average across the state. So I really wanted to say that you know, probably our community makeup, um, the issues, the things that, that I've encountered, that I've seen uh, with doing this program are, are probably likely to what most um, non-heavily urbanized areas in Iowa are going to encounter and see. So, so that's where I think this can be very replicable um, and a good experience for your community too. So now we'll kind of transition uh, into the Bite Size Book Club. And I saw a need um, with our community, but really I'll say the, the nexus, this started with our school district. They had actually applied for one of the um, larger STEM scale, scale up grants. And with that, they wanted to do um, a community wide book discussion with faculty, parents, students, and thought the library would be the perfect place to coordinate with. Uh, so, of course, uh, I'm one that never says no to an opportunity. Uh, so I said, sure, let's give that a try. But then after I thought about it, I thought, well, 
this is a way for us to expand our book club into some different topics. Uh, we do have a monthly book club and I've had a monthly book club here at the library for many years, but primarily that focuses on fiction topics. Um, we don't never really got into too much of uh, nonfiction or social issues or professional development issues. I also saw this as a way that um, the library by offering uh, professional development, at least would be a way to connect with our business community, like those in the chamber, those things like that. You know, I find myself often uh, seeking uh, continuing education opportunities, ways to become a better manager, um, things like that. Uh, and I have to go out of town or attend CE or things like that to do that. Well, why can't we do that here in our community? And like many communities, uh, I'm sure across Iowa, you have lots of uh, established business owners, um, government leaders who have lots of management experience, um, can bring a lot to the table uh, in terms of professional development when you get people together. And I'll have to say that the, the Big Ideas Book Discussion Club, um, a lot of the topics and, and books that they've read, I thought, well, this would be applicable to bring to my community as well. Uh, another inspiration, um, and I think this kind of came up a few years ago, was the Libraries Transforming Communities, the Leading Community Conversations. And at the time that this was really kind of promoted, I never really took the, the big leap to say, yes, how are we going to have tough conversations in our community? Um, it was always, oh, I'd like to do that, but I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So, so the Bite Side Book Club uh, was a way for me to maybe get our toes wet a little bit. And we've, at, we've been doing um, the Bite Size Book Club for probably about a year or two years now. We've done a number of books, and I'll get into more detail as we go on. So our goal here with the Bite Size Book Club is to bring that connection between community leaders and the public um, or business leaders and employees uh, and just business leaders in the library, too. But I also really want it to work to build confidence and knowledge and skills of the attendees. Um, I want those uh, attending this session to hopefully leave with more confidence or knowledge and how they might be able to do something like this in their community. But when we're talking about uh, issues in the Bite Size Book Club, you know, I want people to see the value uh, of their time uh, by attending the book clubs and they can hopefully get something out of it. And also it, it brings that form for open discussion, which kind of ties into that library's transforming communities goal that I had talked about in the previous slide. When I was kind of mulling over how to do this um, and even through the process, you know, there's some assumptions that we've made. And I kind of thought, well, tough topics take more time to digest. Um, normally, when we're reading our, our book club for our fiction book club, you know, it's generally we have about uh, 45 minutes to an hour that we take to discuss the book, and that's kind of it. So you're kind of limited with how much time you can devote to, to really doing that deep dive into the topic. Um, so by breaking up in these sessions, we can really focus on each element of the chapter or the section of the book. Uh, also, uh, I'm, I'm one of those when, when, when I lead the book discussion groups, which fortunately I have great staff that do that for me now. Um, I, I was always the midnight before um, trying to get the book read uh, or skimming the book enough that I can lead a discussion. Whereas knowing that I only have one or two chapters to read for the next meeting has really made it uh, easy for me. Of course, I'm still most likely probably reading those the night before, but I'm not trying to get through 400 pages or 200 pages. It's maybe only 20, 30 or 40 now. So when we started the Bite Size Community Book Discussion, um, this is kind of what it looked like. We were meeting every two weeks, uh, and our meetings lasted anywhere from um, a half hour to an hour. And when we first started, we initially had two meetings, like you can see in our, our flyer there. We met at 7 a.m. at the school, and then we met at noon over the lunch hour at the library. And um, meetings were in this hybrid format even before COVID. So we were offering it that um, people could come in person when you could do that. But we also did it with, uh, I think we were using Zoom uh, at that time too, that they could get the Zoom link and Zoom in with us or call in. And originally it was led uh, by library staff. Uh, so I 
I had to get up early and attend both, but it was interesting because uh, we did have two different kind of perspectives because the school building, primarily those were teachers coming in, and then the 12 was more of the, the general public discussion. So at first I didn't want to get up and go to the, the seven o'clock one, um, but I thought that was very valuable because uh, there were different attendees, they're bringing a different perspective. And then I was able to echo some of that uh, at the other meeting and vice versa. So, like I said, our first book was uh, The Innovator's Mindset. And then we've done a number of these books on your screen. We're still, uh, we haven't done all of these. These are some of my wish books too. When selecting a book, that's probably one of the harder things to do when doing a bite-sized book discussion group or a community-led discussion. And um, one, you can ask for suggestions. Um, like I said, one of the great ways is to uh, look at what maybe the big reads, big ideas uh, book discussion is and, and, and go through that process. And then what books can you take from that? I know they've done um, Dare to Lead and 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. You can also look at what are trending books, uh, look at book reviews, if there's any specific community issues or, or things going on, you might want to, to try to select a book uh, based on that. Uh, of course, just like with our fiction book club, we are always concerned about availability of copies. So how many are out there in, in silo or are we going to have to buy them or do we expect the, the participants to buy their own books? And then something that I found even more important with this than just with like our, our traditional fiction book club is the discussion resources. So, so what's out there that helps you um, do that deeper dive uh, into the conversation? And some of that, some of these books are great when they have the discussion questions built in at the end of each chapter, um, but that's not always the case. I'll kind of jump off topic a little bit here um, and I know this was an ILOC um, topic a few years ago in project management, and um, I'm one that I uh, need to have my Asana or project management software. So to, to keep me on track, uh, we use Asana. We list, you can see here, the, the dates of what chapters we'll be discussing, and then I have a little task that I can check mark and everything to do that to make sure I've sent out the reminders and things like that for people. And I'll talk a little more about those details uh, moving forward. But but this has been a lifesaver um, for me, uh, trying to keep me on track and everything. So a lot of the stuff that I've already talked about and that I will continue to talk about is actually applicable to, to any type of book club that you may be doing or may want to do in your community. And one of the concerns is always, you know, with any program is getting people to attend. And what I found with, with the Bite Size Book Club is is reaching out to, to key community people. Um, you know, your city government, your county government, uh, school administrators and teachers, but also like religious leaders in your community. Um, they can often, you know, oftentimes their Bible study groups I found are, are quite interested in, in discussing, especially social uh, topics as well. But also uh, if you have active community members, um, you know, reaching out to them to see if they maybe want to bring their perspective uh, to the meetings as well. Like I said, that personal invite um, is great, but you can also then use that opportunity to say, hey, um, I think before we actually planned anything, uh, I talked to a lot of these people and said, well, if we did something like this, what topics are you interested in and when could you meet? Um, and then I also found once you've reached out to those, get their emails. Um, when you give them a book or even beforehand and then send them email reminders, updates and follow ups saying, hey, we're meeting. Um, are you going to attend or here are some discussion points and things like that and promote, promote, promote. Um, I know we've had flyers up at the library, at the school, um, around town. And then, of course, our social media and our news, our email newsletters, we really try to promote that this was going on uh, in our community. So. This is probably one of the hardest issues for me because sometimes uh, I feel I can be the time suck as well. But um, oftentimes at any kind of book discussion, you, you may or may not, but have that one person who just hogs the conversation. And um, when you're dealing with professional development uh, or community issues, that can be kind of tough because uh, 
there can be uh, very impassioned or, or people want to speak. They want to be heard, um, especially when you've invited them to come uh, and you want to make sure you have a, a good discussion. So don't be afraid to interject. That's one thing that I had to be like, you know, OK, interject. Um, let's let's see if anyone else has any ideas. Um, but also having a few key questions and a timeline in mind helps. So uh, again, if the book had the discussion questions, that was great. I would also encourage the people uh, attending to read those questions beforehand. Um, but if it didn't, I would make sure I had two, three, four questions uh, on hand that I could go to. Uh, or if someone's uh, taking too long, you can say, well, let's, that's great. In the matter, in the interest of time, let's move on to our next question and we can revisit anything later on. And you can do that through email um, or uh, we haven't tried any like Facebook groups or anything like that, but that's something in the future we might try to incorporate to how to, how can we keep this conversation going uh, after the meeting um, and, and still be engaging with, with those attending and potentially those that can attend. Um, fortunately, I haven't, but I, I, I've considered it uh, in the past with some interactions that, you know, you may have to pull someone aside and have like, hey, you know, I really appreciate that, but, you know, we have limited time uh, and we have a lot of people uh, that want to share their opinions, so you may have to make that kind of personal visit and, and, and everything with them. That's always the toughest conversation or one of the tough conversations to have, but, but that's one way you can deal with people who, who tend to take up a lot of time. You know, on the flip side of that with, with library book discussions, you know, um, you're always concerned, or at least I am, that no one's going to talk. So it's just going to be silence. Um, so like I said, you have those questions ahead of time. So, so you yourself should be ready to answer those. Um, but what I've learned is, uh, as you can tell, I can talk and talk and talk and talk. So uh, try to have your answers have open-ended questions um, or just, you know, well, I took it to be this way. What do you think? Um, because that will encourage the discussion. And then again, you don't end up being that time suck. Um, and also I found, especially early on with the group, having an activity or an icebreaker to start um, is great. Some books may have those in there, but sometimes just a, a team building activity or a, you know, uh, what's on, what's three items on your bucket list and have everyone share that, you know, something like that to, to get people um, comfortable with each other. So now we'll kind of change gears and, and focus more with dealing with the tough topics. So um, you really want to research your book and author um, because there's potential of, of picking a book that sounded really good based on the reviews, but then um, there might be something uh, with that author or with other books they've written that could come up. Um, so I, I would try to be a little, do more research than you would potentially with a fiction book. Um, but also I will recommend that if you start with books or topics that you're a little more comfortable with, um, like maybe you've read it for the, the big ideas um, or in a different group or for your own professional development, if you're a little more comfortable with it, it's a little easier to ease into it. Um, but you can seek out guidance from experts and professionals. So. If there's um, someone in your community who maybe has talked about diversity or inclusion uh, or race, um, poverty, uh, or things like that, you might want to talk to them and see what kind of book recommendations they have or if they'd even help facilitate some of the meetings for you. Um, like I said, professional development, I, I found to be a lot easier than social issues, um, but that doesn't mean it's not something we want to and haven't uh, and will continue to to challenge ourselves with here in Clarenda, at least. And like I said, the tougher the conversation, the more homework is needed. So uh, I found myself doing a lot of self-reflection as we were reading um, our most recent book, Waking Up White. Um, and one of my concerns was, you know, how will we have a conversation in a primarily white community about race? Uh, which is part of the reason why we selected this book um, and I found what really helped out was setting some ground rules. And I really appreciated a couple of the participants um, talked to me after the first couple of meetings and said, it's great that we have these ground rules and we've set them. And I'll be honest, we didn't have ground rules when we did some of our first books, um, the, um, the Innovator's Mindset and the 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. And uh, moving forward, we'll have some form of ground rules 
uh, going forward with every uh, book discussion. Um, I mean, kind of the, the general one is it's okay to disagree, but not be disagreeable. Um, but some of the other rules we had was, um, you know, simple things like silencing your cell phone, but, um, you know, start by assuming good intentions, speak from your own experience using the I statements, as in, I think, I feel, I believe, I want. Um, and it's very important that we create a safe environment. And I actually emailed these out to people too, so, so they have them as well. Again, as I mentioned, the activities and icebreakers can kind of loosen people up. Uh, but I found it really important with the top topics to follow up with people. So sending that email uh, after the meeting, this is what we talked about. Um, this is what we're going to talk about. And then, like I mentioned, finding those resources, um, discussion points or activities. Uh, check with the author's websites uh, and search for other toolkits. I know um, Dare to Lead, uh, there's a great toolkit and resources available on her website um, that you can incorporate into that discussion. Uh, actually, sometimes it gets so deep, it, it's kind of hard to do it in the bite-sized discussion just to discuss the book and then do all the activities. Um, but that's where it at least can, can give you some uh, opportunities to pick and choose what will work with your group. One of the harder things I found is encouraging the dialogue and all sides of the issue. So, so that's where uh, speaking back, thinking back to this morning's presentation is, you know, uh, our unconscious biases. So trying to recognize those and, and how can we make sure that, that those aren't influencing the discussion, uh, especially for someone who's, who's supposed to be leading the, the discussion. It, it's been challenging sometimes to, to make sure that I, I, give those opportunities that the other side has represented it without, you know, not giving it any thought. Um, but one thing I found with, with Waking Up White was uh, developing a reading and resource list. Um, reading that book, I realized that our diversity inclusion uh, collection here at the library was, was not, a, not anywhere where it probably should be. Um, so, uh, we worked to, to up that collection, and, and guess what? I promoted that to those in the book discussion group. Uh, I've also found that if you can reach out to community partners, um, you know, in Colorinda, we don't have too many um, local organizations that, that deal too much with diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, but there are organizations, you know, at least for us in Omaha, Des Moines, and Kansas City, um, I've talked to them a few times, but with COVID, uh, we haven't scheduled anything yet, but that's something we're, we're, we're looking forward to. And of course, um, one thing that we, we haven't necessarily always done with our book clubs, um, and, and we have started uh, with our fiction one and, and now with our bite-sized book one, is, is getting feedback. So asking, you know, what, what did you like about it? Did you learn anything? Um, and with the bite-sized book club, uh, we use some of the resources on project outcome so we could kind of track those from book to book. So, you know, one of the envisions and, and high hopes that I have um, with our bite sized book club is that, you know, this will turn into community action, personal development. Um, so with some things you can actually work with the group to develop or make a plan to keep it going after the fact. Um, and especially with the 13 ways to, to kill your community with that, there was a lot of putting uh, people or putting people in organizations together so that they could take care of things that that they brought up in the meetings. Um, and one of the things I think of is we were talking about uh, community beautification and um, taking care of your your yards and things like that. And and now I, there's there's a community action group working to to get that together. And there's a few people that were in the book club. I I can't take credit that is from the book club, but but I. I nonetheless am very happy to see this action in our community because um, we, we won't necessarily be the only nexus of, of change uh, or action in our community, but, but putting those pieces together and seeing it, um, I think, is, is, a, is a win for our community and hopefully for, for other communities who, who take on challenging topics and discussions. So we'll kind of move on to, to learning from my experiences. Uh, I was going to title this "Learn from My Mistakes," but but I thought that was too negative. Um, so I've learned that the day and time of meeting is important. That's where you probably want to look at um, who you're trying to connect with. Is it 
uh, the general community? Is it business? Um, and, and doing that kind of pre-survey or informal surveys of, hey, if we did something like this, when could you attend and, and things like that. Um, I've mentioned a couple times about those fillers and activities. So the icebreakers, having questions on hand, um, I found were really important. We Sometimes we didn't even use any of the things that I had pre-prepared because the, the discussion itself um, was fine, but it was I was comfortable uh, going into the, the book club having those questions on hand. Like I've also mentioned the email reminders before, don't forget we have a meeting. Again, I assume people are busy, so I sometimes need that reminder the day before or the morning of that we have oh, our meeting today. Um, but then it was also a benefit from some of the participants. We would, I would generally try to, if I didn't get too busy, send out an email after the meeting, um, summarizing some of the talking points or things that we brought up. Uh, because again, assuming people are busy, they can't attend every meeting, um, but they're still reading along. Um, and like I said, uh, ways to keep the conversation going after the meeting. Um, as of right now, we've just kind of done that through email um, or when you run into them at the library or, or somewhere else. But uh, that's something I hope in our future we can develop a little more where we can um, have some type of communication board or even a Facebook group or something like that where, where we can continue to, to talk about these issues. Uh, like I mentioned, um, if you're going to pick um, the topic, you may want to look at your collection uh, before you, you start so you can have some other resources uh, at the same time. But uh, with that, I also will say I was surprised at the number of resources that the group had brought up about, oh, this was a good book on this topic, or I read this book, um, just like your regular fiction book clubs, but, but with the bite-sized book clubs. So, you know, uh, hopefully your budget would allow you to to, to get a few of those resources, or at least make the list because you can always interlibrary loan those as well. Um, don't be afraid to seek help or have others lead. Um, that was one thing that, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed that some topics I'm not too comfortable with or too knowledgeable in. So uh, moving forward, I may try to reach out and have someone come in, uh, if even just for one meeting, uh, maybe to get the, the ball rolling, so to speak, um, and, and make me more comfortable too. Oh, provide copies of the book. Yes, our, our very first one, the, the Innovator's Mindset. Um, it was available, I think, we have Hoopla, and it was available in Hoopla. And uh, my original assumption was people would buy the book, and just like me, they're going to want to have their own copy that they highlight, and they write in the margins, and they underline, and everything like that. Well, of course, I didn't want them to do that with the library books or the books we get through interlibrary loan, so we encourage them to, to use the Hoopla copy, we had a few copies. I think we maybe had two or three copies here at the library, but we encouraged them to get their own. Um, I found then that for our next books, we ordered multiple copies um, ourselves or through Silo that having them on hand, more people were apt to pick up one of those books. Um, I've also learned that it's, it's kind of difficult for um, body language when you're doing it via Zoom. You can kind of tell when you're sitting across from someone that, um, the, the conversation, the topic might be making them uncomfortable, and then you can recognize that and 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 and, and address that. It's it's much harder to do that via Zoom, um, especially when they have their camera turned off. Now, this one I was really conflicted about. Um, for our thirteen ways to kill your community, um, we had um, great newspaper coverage. Um, we had uh, a reporter who was reading the book along with the group and attending the meetings. Um, so we had lots of, of coverage on the Bite Size Book Club and what it was doing. Um, and these are just three of, I think, maybe the five or, or six articles that were in the newspaper. And at first I thought that was great. And, and I'll say the, the articles were, were very well written and very positive. Um, but then you know, I noticed we would have a few conversations where we would get into, well, you know, um, tougher things that you may not want published in the paper. And then actually with talking with some people from the group, they said, well, you know, I was attending, but I'm not going to attend because I don't want to say something and get it in the paper. Um, so that was something that that was a, a benefit uh, for the book club for the most part. But that's something to, to think about, too, is is one of the ground rules 
um, that we laid, although we didn't have any ground rules for the 13 ways to kill your community, um, was kind of, you know, what is said here stays here. And, and uh, although, like I said, the reporter did an excellent job with the coverage and everything, that was one thing that I realized, well, you know, to have a, a candid, open conversation, you have to be comfortable uh, in that environment. And um, it can be difficult when you talk about uh, personal development or leadership, because these people may uh, be working down the street and your cousin may be an employee from them. So when they're talking about management issues and things like that, that's something to be aware of um, in terms of, of kind of your ground rules and, and understanding that, you know, um, these conversations will be tough um, and we want it to be, be uh, private and, and respect each other uh, when you do share those experiences. So, you know, I was like, oh, great, we got, we're in the paper every two weeks. This is wonderful. Um, but then I was like, well, wait, you know, because because I've had, uh, I made some comments in there. It's like, oh, wait, I hope, I hope he doesn't put that in the paper. Um, but uh, then again, because, you know, with, with it being out of context and everything. But, uh, but that was one of the experiences that was eye-opening and I wasn't expecting that. Another issue would be um, group size. Just like most book clubs, um, we, we found that probably 10 was a good number. Uh, we had some uh, books where we only had five people discussing the book throughout the, the course of the discussion and others. Uh, the 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, we actually had probably, I think, about 15. Um, so that's where uh, to me, that 10, 11 is about the perfect number. And, you know, we would meet every two weeks and we would take a couple chapters or a section or two of the book each week. So it generally would take us about um, anywhere from three, four, five months to get through the whole book. Um, so because of that, um, people come and go and can people join at any time? Um, that's a tough one. I think it depends on the book, but it also depends on the group dynamics too. And I was surprised um, at the time investment uh, because like I said, doing that research um, of the book ahead of time, making sure you have discussion questions. Um, it was, it, it's more than just doing a regular fiction book discussion, um, but to me, I hope that the people who attend, and, and from the feedback I've gotten this, but to me, uh, most of the personal development, you know, it's personal. So it, it's really eye-opening and, and that research, that, that homework you put in, uh, hopefully allows the participants to, to have some of that more eye-opening experiences. Oh, one of the great things too um, was we were able to uh, visit with um, a few of the authors and we have one coming up here in about a month. And uh, given COVID, um, hopefully this is even more so, but, but uh, I found with, with George here, uh, we reached out to him and I just said, hey, we're a small community doing a community-wide book discussion group. Would you like to uh, zoom in with us? And, you know, I've done that in the, in the past with our fiction book club. And, you know, you're always like, I hope they say yes and they don't charge us anything. And it's amazing at, at how many authors are just willing to uh, carve out uh, a half hour or 45 minutes of their day to, to talk with the group. Um, so uh, we did uh, George at the end of the book discussion group. I think some of the books um, it might be a benefit to actually have the author visit before you talk about the book. Um, I've kind of noticed there's been a few topics, like with George, I thought, well, he might have been a good kind of amp up the book and get us excited about it um, rather than visiting at the end. And then we have another author, um, The Waking Up White, Debbie Irving. Um, she'll be talking with us next month, and I think it's, it's very good that we're doing it after we discuss the book. And... I wanted to include a few slides about COVID. So online in person, um, probably like most of you, we, we've had uh, the higher engagement always seems to be with in person compared to online. But 
uh, this was one of the programs that we actually, like I said, have been doing the hybrid programming um, in the first from the get-go. So we always kind of offered that Zoom Zoom option, but we found most people weren't zooming in. And even when we finished uh, Waking Up White, which we did this past fall, you know, uh, the the attendance had dropped from when we were meeting in person to when we switched totally to Zoom. Uh, and like I said, marketing that's that's been a challenge um, pre-COVID. Uh, how can we engage and get people aware of what's going on? And and one of the best successes we found is just like with our regular fiction book club uh, book of the month is we just have the book sitting on the counter and people ask, what is this? Is this the book club? Can I check this out? Um, and then we, we have that conversation with them, uh, hopefully get them the book and then try to get their email. So then we can send them those, hey, we're having a meeting. Here's the Zoom link or here are the discussion questions as well. So looking at the future of um, the Bite Size Book Club. Some of the ideas that, that I've had here for our community is how can we expand that discussion? So community groups or a county read or even with our sister city, I thought, because we have a sister city in Japan. Um, so I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we probably, it probably wouldn't work, especially in Japan with the time difference to um, necessarily meet every two weeks and discuss the same chapters at the time. But what if uh, we discussed Waking Up White, and then um, another group or community did it. And then after they did that, then we had maybe a, a get together or the Zoom or the author visit um, and had all the entities uh, attending. So then you could have one, one broader discussion at the end. Um, we've had ideas. Uh, I want to do our next book might be made. Um, and I've looked at doing like poverty simulation. Uh, but again, with COVID, it's kind of how can we do that? Um, and we've been discussing with our school, how can we increase youth, youth involvement? So I know that when um, Debbie Irving, the author of Waking Up White, when she's visiting with us, there's going to be a group at the school that's been reading books, uh, read, I believe read her book um, and other books on the topic. They're going to be Zooming in at the same time that we're having the Zoom session with her here at the library. Um, but but then, like I said at our first point, how can we get them together uh, to have those conversations, especially across uh, age groups? I think that would be really neat down the road. So I wanted to kind of tie us back to, to our theme today and um, diversity, equity, inclusion. And one of the things that, that I've realized going through um, the Bite Size Book Club was, you know, does your city or library have an EDI statement? Um, and we were actually working just recently on a federal grant with the hospital. And, and one of the criteria was that they had some type of statement. And I was like, you know, we don't have that. And I was talking with other members of the of the, the Bite Size Book Club and they were like, well, that's kind of foreign to us. What is that? And, and we, we had a conversation about what are these? What does it mean? Why do we need these? You know, it was kind of interesting side note that came up that, that that this is why we have these discussions, why we, why we talk about these books and bring up these topics, because um, you know we get busy in our day to day that we don't necessarily uh, make the considerations of, of what type of impact our actions are having. So I thought it was really fitting um, that this is our topic and our session. You know, just a few days ago was Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, day. So the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So I just thought that was really fitting with, with taking topics that are tougher and leading community conversations. So um, I'll kind of leave it here for you guys. If you have questions, I know Nancy and Scott were kind of watching the chat here. I hope I I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation and get something out of it. Uh, my email and phone number are here, so I'm always open to, to uh, answering questions. Or if you have really great books that were challenging and great discussions in your community, put them in the chat or send them to me because, like I said, I'm always looking for ones as well. So not a lot of questions, or at least the one that the big question that came up, you answered right as she asked it. So that was good timing. Um, and that was on how long... Um, how many, did you do it all in one sitting or did you do it over time? Which I think you mentioned right at the beginning, but if they didn't log on right away, they might not have heard that. Um, but then you were talking about it taking multiple different 
um, sessions of your book discussion. You got a lot of comments on the books that you highlighted. I, I put out there that I'm glad you use books from Big Ideas Book Discussion because we do put a lot of thought. I will comment on your thought about making sure you know the book first because we have made that mistake um, and you get caught up in that a little bit. We had to just change our current book um, that'll be next month, Wintering. Um, we had chosen one called Hugge, um, but the book itself, after one of our participants read it, looked like it had been translated into English and not edited. It was a really difficult read, and we hadn't actually opened the book yet. So <laughs> good point, Andrew. Um, some other comments that were made um, were a good point about including the press and maybe um, using that as a ground rule is nothing, you know, what's said in here stays in here, especially on, like you said, hard topics or even leadership. A lot of people don't want to share their personal experiences. So, but nice to get that press. Um, let me see. I see a question. Does, what does EDI mean? Oh, equity, diversity, inclusion statement. Which is the topic of our ILOC sessions today. So, um, but yeah, people hear the equity, diversity, inclusion, and don't necessarily always get the acronym for it. Um, I have that with BIPOC too. Um, and that's that one I have to look up occasionally because I forget what the different parts of it mean. Um, Bonnie commented that she has a brother-in-law in Wisconsin who belongs to Rotary and his Rotary Club does book discussions similar to what you've described, choosing books that lead to community action projects, which then the Rotary members take participation or participate in. So kind of leads back to what you're hoping to do and what you mentioned with Big Ideas book discussion and the beautification part of it. Um, yeah, we had no, a lot of comments on liking that book. Yeah, the, the Rotary Club, I know they've taken that 13 ways, not ours, but I know others in other communities. And, and like I said, if you have a Rotary Club or a Qantas, um, that is kind of your, that could potentially be a built-in bite-sized book discussion group right there. Um, if you're looking at how can I promote it or, or get people connected. Um, that, that was one of the concerns. And one of the surprising things, I, I didn't mention this, was, you know, our, our fiction book club uh, attendees are kind of, you know, the consistent, we know who they are, what they read, but um, the bite-sized book club, we had a number of attendees that continued um, throughout the course, um, some key people, but we had a lot of different people coming and going depending on what the topic was. And these were people that don't necessarily come into the library that often. Uh, one of the most interesting ones was with the 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. We had um, two people from the city council of a, a town, uh, uh, two towns over, coming to be part of the discussion and, and, and everything. So I thought that was really interesting. And, and they brought great perspective then to the group because they were slightly outside of the, the, the community. Yeah, if that, to me, that book just opens up so many discussions, especially in small town Iowa, um, yes. because of the mindsets that exist. Um, we've had a lot of comments on um, great ideas for future programming and future book discussions in their libraries. Um, where Strawberry Point wanted to know, where do libraries include the EDI statement or do you just have a statement posted? Any well, thoughts on that? We, we don't have a statement yet, but we would just probably include it. You know, it's one of those things. That's a good question. I was thinking, well, we just include it with our, you know, ALA statement of freedom and things like that. But, you know, to me, as I, as I think now on that question is it probably should be, you know, in your policies, but maybe posted on the board or posted where people can see it or where staff can see it. Um, as a good reminder. Know. Um. Another question was, will your list of books um, be listed anywhere? Do you list them on your website? I don't think we do. Um, the books that we've used uh, were kind of in that first slide there. Uh, so they'll be in the, the presentation notes when they, when they get put up. Um, and then our, our list, right now we've just been emailing the list that we create for the, the collection development to the attendees. But we do have the capabilities in our our library system to, you know, like here, click on this link and you get to all of them. So that's a good idea. 
and and this is recorded so you will be able to check it out later too um somebody asked could you your edi statement be listed with your mission statement yes i think that's probably a good place for it a lot of good comments from people on um, how good they found this and that it provided them with lots of information so i believe we're at 11 o'clock and i want to thank you so much it was